All right, so who am I? I'm, my name is Keith Clamp. So I'm the Libertarian candidate for U.S. District 1. And I'll be on the ballot with, uh, against Tim Scott and, and Ben Frazier and the other defendants. Um, I've met you before, and I remember sitting up here with those men behind me who I think were fine men, and I'm the only one left. Um, I think that one of the things I wanted to talk, I want to keep this kind of informal because we, we're learning together. I mean, this is a process where we all understand what's at stake. We all understand that we have a, learning to, a lot of learning to do, a lot of truths to seek. So I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to do that with you. It's a process. You know, this experience for me has been absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm, you know, I came from just a regular person trying to get involved in the political process, and as I have gone through this process, I realized how almost impossible that is to do. I mean, from the Republican uh, perspective, trying to get that nomination, or trying to be involved in that is, is not very easy to do. Uh, from, any, from any outsider perspective, trying to get on a ballot is a very, very difficult thing. Then trying to meet with the right people, then trying to get the press to at least cover you, all those things are almost impossible. And you know, what I'm looking at, what I found, was you know I, I'm concerned about the economics in this country from the perspective of my father. Uh, I'm very close to my father. We work together. I understand that Social Security is unsustainable, and I know that I am his retirement. Um, and that scares me. And the only reason, or one of the major reasons that I got involved in this, we work so hard. We're a general contractor, basically, and we work every day, all the time, you can ask my family. And I can't imagine surviving this recession, and then our, our currency devalues and it's all about it. And I look at my father, who was on the verge of retirement, having to put back on his tools, having to get up every morning and bust his butt, and I feel for him, I really do. And the reason that I got involved in this is because I wanted to know why. I wanted to know what happened. What, why, why is this happening to the baby boomers who are one of the hardest working generations I've ever known? And here they are, getting to the end of the game, and it's not there. And, and I don't think that these things are being addressed honestly, and that's why you see me here, regardless of political party, because there's a message out there right now. You have the Democrats with total government, you have the Republicans with big government, and you have us with small government. And that small government discussion has to be there. It has to be. Because we see where big government has got us. So uh, what I wanted to talk about was the primary. Now, I was involved in the GOP primary. You remember me debating, and I did a lot of debates with those GOP guys. And there were a lot of good men. I mean, I really liked Mark Lutz. Uh, Kabrowski had a lot of good things to say. Um, and, I, and I saw that the activists were getting uh, behind these people. But we also knew that the establishment, the regular GOP, had selected their candidate before this thing even started. We knew who they wanted. We knew who they were going to put money behind. And that's who got elected. I mean, ultimately, six people up in Columbia, South Carolina, who had a lot of money, decided who was going to be the next congressman if I can't beat him. And something about that is wrong. Something. You know, what we hear about is the wasted vote factor. Okay, so you look at the third party, and this is a wasted vote. What was that primary? How many people in this room voted for a, for a Tea Party candidate? Probably quite a few. And then it came around again, and people voted for the Tea Party candidate. And again, the establishment just wanted what they wanted, they got what they wanted. And for me, I thought that that process was pretty gross. And, and I knew, looking at Mark Lutz and talking to them, and going through ideas about small government, that they wouldn't be here, and it would be just me. And now, how many times do you see me on television? How many times do you read about me in the paper? Probably not very many. So the fight, the, the fight that we have is very, very intense. And, you know, I think the thing that's very scary about it, too, is that when you come to the GOP or an establishment candidate, that, that is someone who is being, his strings are being pulled from somewhere else. You know, and that, to me, again, is not a good representa representation of the people. Um, you know, what we're looking at, ultimately, if you start digging, you know, what we found going around to the activists and doing, the, the, the different people who are active in the community right now, they're digging, they're trying to find the truth. They want to understand how this country works. They want to understand the different perspectives. And they're getting to a certain point, and they're stopping. They're stopping their digging process. They're getting angry. They're getting outraged. They're lashing out. But you've got to keep digging. You, know, you need to understand the roots of progressivism. Or you need to even go further back to, to Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, where a lot of the arguments that we see nowadays are Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. 
So it was Thomas Jefferson was small government. He was states' rights. Alexander Hamilton was Federalist. He was for a strong, centralized government. And this has been a long battle in our country. And what you're seeing today is a continuation of that battle. And why it's very difficult for us as individuals to figure out what side of the fence to rely on is because a lot of the Republicans are Hamiltonians. Newt Gingrich himself said one of the most influential people in his uh, educational process is Alexander Hamilton. And that's something that you need to know. That's what we need to know as we dig, as we learn, we figure out what's this all about. We have to, for me, as a Southerner, you know, as I'm a military person, I'm a Navy veteran, my father's Navy, 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 so you can assume I'm fairly conservative. You know, when you go through this process, you have to let go of some of the ideas that you founded yourself on. And it's hard. It's very hard. Um, well, you know, from there, I think what we found with the Hamiltonian argument of government is that the heart of big government is centralized banking. Centralized banking throughout history has empowered states to do more than, their, than the citizens want them to do, basically. Well, we have formed our argument around that because I'm here as an adult. I'm a working man. I have my own company. I get up in the morning. I invoice myself. I carry my own insurance, licensing permit. I do it all. I'm looking at the situation, and it looks like a bunch of children up there destroying our country. So it's time for the adults to step up, go up there, fix it, so we can all make money again and get back to work. That's how I look at it. And nobody in this discussion is offering real solutions. What, what I watch is, you watch the, uh, the, the other, can, or other candidates around the nation, they say, I'm for small government. What does that mean? How are you going to accomplish that? Why has that not happened in 100 years? What does it mean? Why can we get up here? We're smarter than that. Our audience is more sophisticated than that. You can't just say things that we like to hear and expect us to just get up and cheer and vote you in. Now the time is critical. We need to know what that means. What is small government? Right? What about the Constitution? If you're going back to the Constitution, then why not, why uh, Article, what's it, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, or Clause 5? Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. Those both say that there is no constitutional ability for the Federal Reserve. If we're going back to the Constitution, why not all of it? I'm why the Fed. I'm the Fed. I'm the Fed. So why, why is it that we can be selective on one part and not the other? And what I find, too, is I go through these groups. You know, here we are facing a devaluation of our currency. We're looking at economic collapse, and that is not a joke. And we are arguing over who gets to spend what on what. You know, so you look at, from our perspective or from, from the, uh, the right perspective, nationalizing health care, these things are too expensive. We can't afford it. You can't intrude on my personal liberty, blah, blah, blah. Then you go over to the right, and Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex. It is one of the biggest expenses that we deal with, but we can't touch that. But we're going broke. We're going broke. So here, I'm just a regular person, and the crazy thing that I see is you've got the right and the left. You know, obviously, we're one thing they're bipartisan on, you know, that, that we're crazy. But we're, I have a very normal perspective, and I look at this, and it's just math. And it doesn't matter if someone agrees with it or doesn't agree with it. We simply cannot afford it. So my, our solution in this whole thing, when we look at it, we cannot sustain the programs that we have now. It's not possible. We cannot repay the debt that we have now. It's not possible. And why would a government continue to amass such amounts of debt, run in high deficits, uh, propose budget deficits, and, and do things that they can't afford? It's because they have absolutely no intent of paying for them in the first place. Because our government has the ability to print money out of thin air. It's like you or I wanting a Ferrari, but we can't afford it. So we go to a copying machine, and we copy enough dollars so that we can. So if the government is able to monetize their debt through a counterfeiting process, through the Federal Reserve, then it devalues the money that my father saved his whole life. And it's a tax. It's a tax, folks. And that's what this is all about. That's what the Tea Parties were about. Taxation without representation. And that's what we're dealing with.